I was asked by the illustrious Reverend Dr. Len Pine to speak about the illustrious Reverend Dr. John Witherspoon. And it is John Witherspoon who once in the legislature of the state of New Jersey said, there are two kinds of speaking that are very interesting. The one is perfect sense, and the other is perfect nonsense. He continued, when there is speaking in either of these ways, I shall engage to be all attention. But when there is speaking, as there often is, halfway between sense and nonsense, you must bear with me if I fall asleep. <laughs> so it is my goal, this speech, that you not fall asleep, that my speech be in one of those two pure categories, and preferably the former. We'll be looking today at John Witherspoon and the connecting of American Presbyterians in four parts. And I think conveniently now, I think we have about four hours till we have to go to the, uh, <laughs> to the dinner tonight. But we'll see if we can get it done in a briefer, than that, uh, briefer section than that. So we have four sections here on John Witherspoon. First, we're going to be looking at a brief survey of 18th century American Presbyterian history. And that's where that handout that you should hopefully all have will come in handy. OK, you have more. Part two, connecting John Witherspoon and America. Part three will be on John Witherspoon's connecting of American Presbyterians. And then finally, part four on American Presbyterians connecting today. Now, you students of American Presbyterian history, as I know we all are here, you're familiar with that chart that displays through all those various splits and mergers, the family tree of American Presbyterian denominations. But every version, essentially, of that chart that I've seen begins in 1789, the year of the first General Assembly. So the biggest flaw in those charts is that they skip over nearly a century of American Presbyterian history. Whole churches, presbyteries, synods, and sides came and went before there ever was a PCUSA. While the first Presbyterians in the colonies depended heavily upon Scotland, Ireland, and England for their trained ministers, the churches themselves were homegrown, not plants from any particular old world Presbyterian church body. They developed organically and with little bureaucracy. Churches came together in presbyteries starting in 1706 and synods in 1717. So to visualize that pre-1789 American Presbyterian history, I've created that chart that is in front of you, showing these presbyteries and synods that are precursors to the first general assembly. Now, those of you who are very interested in American Presbyterian history will probably already note, already can tell that the covenanters, the seceders, they're not included. Here in this chart, we're looking at all of those synods and presbyteries that formed into the national body. It's a little bit hard to see. You can, you can see on the chart there, it's very hard to put this all together, but we have these little dotted line boxes for the synods themselves. You can see that the Synod of Philadelphia was the first there, comprising some of those presbyteries. But then as you go chronologically from left to right, you'll see that the Synod of New York develops as well, splitting off, but also creating or, or pulling in some new presbyteries. So this, as, we, as you look at that chart, the, the primary event in the 18th century in American Presbyterian history is that old side, new side split. That's what happens there with, with the fact that there are two simultaneous synods, the Synod of Philadelphia and the Synod of New York. In that event, churches and, and presbyteries were rearranged as ministers went either the way of the orderly old side or the revivalist new side. 
The churches of the original synod, that of Philadelphia, became known as Old Side, and the New Side formed a new synod, the Synod of New York, with parts of some of the Presbyterians that left from Philadelphia, along with the addition of New York and New Brunswick Presbyteries, that previously had no synodical membership. So you can see they're starting to coalesce into a larger group. Now this old side, new side split or schism was healed in 1758 and the presbyteries came together in one new synod. And while we had started with the synod of Philadelphia and New York came later, now we have the synod of New York and Philadelphia. So they've switched it around and that seems to be dependent on the fact that the new side grew faster. And when they came back together, they had the control to say, let's call it the Synod of New York and Philadelphia. But ironically, it was only after these synods came together into this United Synod that, as you see in your chart there, the Philadelphia Presbytery divides into a first of Philadelphia, that was new school, and a second of Philadelphia, that was old school. And again, that's interesting that the new school gets first and the old school gets second. I think that shows the relative strength of the sides at that time. So if the presbyteries are dividing while the synod unites, clearly that healing was far from complete. The old side, new side split hadn't been fully healed. But following the American Revolution, we find it healed and we find the church coming together like never before into a national level general assembly. One might accurately say that from 1789, the year of the first general assembly, to 1837, when we have the old school, new school split, from that period, that's 48 years, we have the period in American history in which the largest percentage of Presbyterians were united together in one ecclesiastical organization. This unitedness or connectedness of American Presbyterians in that period certainly is attributable to many factors. But among these, we cannot ignore the role of John Witherspoon, the most central figure connecting the American Presbyterian Church in the Revolutionary Era. And yet it's somewhat surprising that he's not particularly well known today. I may have heard of him in seminary, but you're much more likely to hear about Archibald Alexander and Hodge and Thornwell and various others. But John Witherspoon is um, very prominent early on. We'll see his role in bringing the churches together. But before we look at how John Witherspoon connected the American Presbyterians, I want to first look at how John Witherspoon was connected to America itself. It's really quite a fascinating story. I was able to um, get a copy of an old book, and it's, it's a collection of the letters all about wooing John Witherspoon to the presidency of what was then the College of New Jersey, later Princeton. So we'll look at that here in part two, connecting John Witherspoon and America. In the beginning of the works of the Reverend John Witherspoon, there's a prefatory memoir that briefly summarizes some of the man's credentials. Minister of Christ, President of Princeton University, Member of the Continental Congress, signer of the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation, member of the New Jersey Convention for the Ratification of the Constitution, organizer of the Presbyterian Church along national lines, author of numerous books and essays, etc. Quite a busy and connected man. In some of those areas, as, as you read about Witherspoon, I, I mentioned he's not particularly popular today, but there are some books through the years. At least three biographies of the man have been written, and there are relatively recent books on John Witherspoon and the founding of the American Republic, John Witherspoon's American Revolution, and another on the piety of John Witherspoon. But 
none of these books, and comparatively little, has been written on what he would have considered to be his primary occupation as a minister of Christ. And very little has been written in modern times on the work he did as a minister to organize the church, to connect it together on national lines. His work there was indeed quite substantial. So influential, in fact, on the American scene was Witherspoon, and so quickly did he embrace American ideals that one might overlook the fact that the man was Scottish and spent over half of his life in that, his native country. This risk is now somewhat mitigated by Kevin DeYoung's recent PhD dissertation, 2019, titled John Witherspoon and the Fundamental Doctrines of the Gospel, the Scottish Career of an American Founding Father. DeYoung's dissertation reminds us that before coming to America, Witherspoon, before he came to America to become president of a college, Witherspoon was a minister of the gospel and sometimes a controversialist in the Church of Scotland. If you read the history, you know of a number of controversies, controversies he was involved in. There in Scotland, Witherspoon was a respected leader in the Popular Party. This was one of the groups in the church. The Popular Party supported the right of each congregation to choose its own minister. Opposed to them was the, the, their adversaries, the Moderate Party. The Popular Party, I say, was clearly evangelical. The Moderate Party, mixed, perhaps at best. So Witherspoon's name came to the attention of the trustees at the College of New Jersey, an institution then critical in the training of American Presbyterian ministers, and an institution that was, again, looking for a new president. As an evangelical, Witherspoon was attracted, attractive to the trustees of the college. Even more, he had not participated in that old side, new side controversy. He wasn't seen as one or the other. He could bring healing to that schism that was not quite completely healed. So he made an excellent choice for the presidency. <coughs> Those feelings of trouble, resentment still remained, but Witherspoon promised to bring greater unity to the American church. I said that he was called, at, they were calling again for a president at Princeton because there were some problems in the past. In fact, taking upon the presidency of the College of New Jersey did not bring with it much assurance of personal health and safety. If past results were indicative at all of future expectations, it was a downright dangerous job. The reason the college was again looking for a president, was that each of the four previous presidents had died on the job. <laughs> in a short number of years, in fact. DeYoung comments, as the institutional heir to William Tennant's pro-revival log college, the College of New Jersey had been run by a succession of new side pastors, capable men whose chief weakness was a penchant for dying after assuming the role of president. <laughs> so when the trustees wrote to Witherspoon, trying to connect him to America and to their college, when they wrote to him in Scotland with hopes that he would accept their election of him to the presidency of the college, the first subject of their business was to assure him of the healthfulness of the place. <laughs> the president of the trustees, William Peartree, wrote to Witherspoon, November 19, 1766. He said this to Witherspoon. It's quite interesting. I'll read it as modern English as possible. It's quite creative spelling in the time. He says this. The loss of four presidents in the compass of a few years hath been owing to singular circumstances and occasioned by a variety of infirmities which attended them previous to their removal to Nassau Hall. Nassau Hall is the main building there at Princeton. And he, he always emphasizes previous, before. He says, Mr. Burr, the first who presided, was a gentleman of infirm constitution, almost worn out before he came to the college. We didn't do it. 
<laughs> Mr. Edwards died of the smallpox. Now we all know, actually, I think he died of the, of the vaccine of the smallpox, but close <laughs> enough. Kind of difficult subject in our time. <laughs> Very difficult. Mr. Davies, constitutionally prone to inflammatory disorders, being let blood on a cold he had taken, an inflammation seized his arm, which brought on a fever and proved mortal. Dr. Finley died of a scarce liver and consequent dropsy, the foundation of which disorder laid, was laid some years before his appointment. So it is very clear, New Jersey, beautiful place, it's not our fault. <laughs> We're taking out some of the greatest theologians in the 18th century. I mean, most of those names should be familiar to you. Of course, Edwards is, and Burr, Davies, maybe a little less with Finley, but these are all prominent men, one after another. But the call must have taken Witherspoon by surprise as well for another reason. He was, in fact, the first ever to be invited from abroad to be the president of an American college. So you imagine you receive this envelope there in Scotland, all the way from America, and it says you have been elected president. Quite shocking. But it turns out the chief difficulty of getting Witherspoon to take the job, to come to America, turned out to be not any fear of the healthfulness of the situation, no fear of New Jersey's air or a presidential curse, but rather what held him back was the trepidation of Mrs. Sarah Witherspoon in considering leaving Scotland behind, undergoing the journey to America, and living in a new place entirely apart from family and connections. Strenuously did she protest against this unheard of transatlantic migration. The Reverend Doctor sent a letter back to the uh, Richard Stockton of the college explaining their decision. He said, I felt a very strong inclination to have accepted the office to which I was chosen, but family difficulties continue as great as ever. Indeed, I am now convinced are insurmountable. My wife continues under such distress on the subject that for some weeks after you left us, she was scarcely ever half a day out of bed at a time, till I told her at any rate to make herself easy for whatever inclination I might have to it, the removal was of such a nature that I would not insist upon it unless she could be brought to agree to it. Pastors, be very glad you do not have to try to convince your wife to embark on a three-month ocean-going trip to your next pastorate. Witherspoon, being a smart man, declined the call. But Benjamin Rush, a graduate of the College of New Jersey, and he was then studying at uh, uh, for medical uh, field in Edinburgh, he wasn't quick to give up on Witherspoon. There was still this desire to have him there, to connect the Presbyterians together. He's needed, despite the family difficulties. Responding to Rush's plea to again reconsider the presidency, Witherspoon promised a second attempt. He wrote, I am resolved once more to make trial of proposing the thing to my wife. And if it can be made agreeable, it will be a great pleasure to me. But this attempt did not prove any more successful than the first. It seems to have only made things worse, Witherspoon wrote to Rush, explaining. Since I wrote you on Wednesday, I have again proposed the scheme of going to New Jersey to my wife. But I cannot say with much or indeed with any hope of success. She was excessively struck with the bare mention of it again, as having believed it to be quite over, and discovered the same, or if possible, a greater aversion at it than ever, plainly saying that such a resolution would be as a sentence of death to her. I shall, out, I shall however, be very desirous, if convenient, to see you here on Monday or Tuesday next week, that we may have a concluding conference upon the subject. If she will enter into conversation with you, it will be more in your power than in mine to give an account of the place and manner of life there as to remove prejudices. Finally then, upon Benjamin Rush's visit 
There, in person, there was success. Finally, he talked away her fears and objections. The success is noted in Benjamin Rush's journal from August 16th of that year. Rush writes, In consequence of an invitation and an appointment, I set off this day to pay a visit to the Reverend Dr. Weatherspoon at Paisley, a flourishing village about five miles, past, or five miles beyond Glasgow. The design of this visit was to cooperate with the doctor in endeavoring to remove his wife's objections to going to America. After spending some days at his house, we were so happy as to succeed in our persuasions and embraced an opportunity which very fortunately offered a few days afterwards of writing to the trustees of the college that the way was now open for the doctor's accepting of the president's chair should the trustees think proper to choose him a second time. This affair turned out according to our wishes, for in January 1768, we received the vote of the trustees confirming the doctor's re-election. Mrs. Sarah Witherspoon, like another Sarah, was willing to follow her husband. Witherspoon was coming to America. One graduate of the college there at New Jersey at this time said sarcastically, for he was a Scot himself, Witherspoon is president. Mercy on me. We shall be overrun with Scotchmen, the worst vermin under heaven. <laughs> but despite his heavy brogue, it wasn't long before Witherspoon was considered very much an American, embracing the principles of his new land and even leading in the cause for independence. For Witherspoon, it was always providence that brought him to the new world and providence would lead him in his church affairs. It is that subject that we now turn. As we look at part three, John Witherspoon's connecting of American Presbyterians. His, you know, with the contributions of John Witherspoon towards the connecting of American Presbyterians, of course, is quite wide and varied over his many years working in the church. We've spoken before of the troubles going on there with the old side, new side controversy. So when he comes, it's, there's still trouble. But by the time of his death, 26 years later, we find the church with a national level general assembly. And a church that's prepared to grow into this great force that it would become in the 19th century. So it's a very crucial time period, turning from a small a colonial church into a national church, much with Witherspoon's work. Soon after arriving in America, Witherspoon set out on visits, both to New England and to Virginia, raising funds for the college. This fundraising trip helped shore up finances for a time and brought Witherspoon connection with many Presbyterian ministers. His teaching there at the College of New Jersey, later Princeton, influence the next generation, or perhaps two, of Presbyterian ministers. His biographer, and the, the best of the three biographies, uh, by Varnum Lansing Collins, records that at that first General Assembly in 1789, of the 188 ministers in attendance, 97 had attended Princeton, and 52 of those had been students of Witherspoon. So over a quarter of the church at that time, at the First General Assembly, had been trained principally by that one man, Witherspoon. And I say principally because in those days, the president taught the courses and preached the sermons, in addition to all the other tasks that we've seen Witherspoon get involved in. Alongside his role there as the college president, a very visible role, Witherspoon's leadership in national politics during the American Revolution provided him with the standing to then lead in the formation of the denomination. Though his arrival in 1768, his arrival to America, gave him less than a decade of teaching in peace before revolution broke out, he quickly rallied to the American cause and contributed much to it. During the war, Witherspoon voluntarily took half of his salary only half, to allow the college to hire another professor 
who was needed as Witherspoon was regularly away at the Continental Congress. There, he served on a number of committees and became well connected with the nation's founding fathers. His students, nearly without exception, supported the American Revolution, many of them becoming officers in the Army. And no doubt, the war was of great personal loss to the Witherspoons, as his son James was killed at the Battle of Germantown in Pennsylvania. And while there's much that could be written, has been written, on Witherspoon and his work during the war, we want to focus here on his efforts after the war, especially in connecting American Presbyterians. His role as the college president and his work in both the Continental Congress and the legislature of the state of New Jersey provided Witherspoon with the standing to be the one to reorganize the church. But the revolution ended with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. And it's not until a full six years later that we find the first General Assembly. Six years go by from the time it becomes a nation until the time we have a national church. That seems like a long time even by Presbyterian standards. So what happened during those intervening years? 1784, 85, 86, 87, 88. The war was over, the church not yet founded, on a national level, but slowly coming together. We find first in 1784, a disaster year for Witherspoon. He was sent by the college on an ill-advised fundraising trip to Great Britain, where sentiment there remained strongly opposed to the new nation. <laughs> ill-advised is perhaps not a strong enough term. Not surprisingly, the venture did not bring success. Then on the return trip from England, through some accident on the ship, Witherspoon lost sight permanently in one of his eyes. Making matters worse, the same year brought the death of his youngest daughter. But he continued on. In 1785, we find the first proposal for the creation of that General Assembly. And it goes before the Synod of New York and Philadelphia. Delays occurred, according, de delays occurred due to the necessity of writing a constitution. The church, it was argued, needed a delegated national level gathering. The nation was simply becoming too large to have all the ministers travel to synod every year. Witherspoon, who found himself as much at home in Virginia as Massachusetts, and who was neither old side nor new side, and who had earned respect as a president, professor, preacher, and statesman, was trusted to do the work. He was appointed chairman of a special committee to consider the constitution of the Church of Scotland and other Protestant churches, and to compile a system of general rules for the government of the Synod, the presbyteries under its inspection, and the people in its communion, and to report at the next meeting of the Synod. Witherspoon then proposed an overture to break up the Synod into three or more synods. It eventually became four. So his overture passed, making a general assembly of the whole of the three or four synods. He was appointed chairman also to, to a committee to prepare a book of discipline and government. After discussion, Witherspoon's proposals, of his proposals at the 1786 and 87 synods, finally in 1788, his whole plan, the confession of faith, the two catechisms, the directory for worship, the form of government and discipline was adopted. And it was resolved that the first meeting of the General Assembly be held the next year with Witherspoon preaching the opening sermon. There, Witherspoon was not, with apologies to Professor Lynch, not the moderator of the first General Assembly. Technically, he was the convening moderator, although many books do indeed say that he was the a moderator. But he was the first to convene the General Assembly. He gave a sermon, and then a moderator was chosen, a man named John Rogers. But yet, Witherspoon's honor was no less diminished. He was involved in everything, Ashbel Green noted. In the Synod of New York and Philadelphia, which before the foundation of the General Assembly was the supreme judicatory of the Presbyterian Church in this country, 
Witherspoon was, when present, placed on almost every important committee. The published acts of this synod, after he joined it in 1769, were mostly from his pen. Informing the present constitution of the Presbyterian Church, his agency and influence were all but dominant. But returning to our chart that you have in front of you, we can see that with the formation of the General Assembly, which is right on the far end of your page there, right as your page ends, that's where the assembly starts, no new churches were added to the denomination. Neither was, any church, neither was the church any more geographically broad than in the previous years. Ultimately, this was a restructuring of the church, now with four synods comprised of a total of 16 presbyteries. So what can be said of Witherspoon's actual impact? He didn't need to write for the denomination a declaration of independence from any European church, because the church always was independent. American churches were homegrown. And Witherspoon's opposition to the ecclesiastical high-handedness operative in the patronage of the Church of Scotland would have itself found little opposition in America, in the American church, where congregations had always chosen their own pastors. Further, while the Scottish Witherspoon led the General Assembly to choose the Westminster Standards with only minor changes, the standards had long been accepted by the American churches. None of this changed. So what was Witherspoon's main work? The main effect of Witherspoon's work, as we noted, is, was to restructure the church, but also to provide it with a new book of discipline and government. Witherspoon modified the 1645, the form of Presbyterian church government, to create the 1788 form of government and discipline. Big difference. Just slightly different terminology. But a major difference in the documents was the addition of these preliminary principles that Witherspoon penned. These principles remain in the official documents of many Presbyterian churches today, including our own, here in the form of government of the Bible Presbyterian Church. If you have the same copy of, as I do, it's on page 127, the preliminary principles. That's mostly Witherspoon. In fact, of these uh, preliminary principles, the first six of them are identical, or nearly so, in our BP Constitution today. So Witherspoon had a significant influence in writing our documents. And then a few of the others are slightly changed from his previous points. So what are these preliminary principles? Today we spoke of the declaratory statement. We also have preliminary principles. And how do these, how does Witherspoon's work here bring connectivity to the church? Well, these Preliminary principles are the general principles or the groundwork of the rest of the form of government and discipline. Here Witherspoon writes, they do not even wish to see any religious constitution aided by the civil power further than may be necessary for protection and security, at the same time equal and common to all others. Also he included the statement, they also believe there are truths and forms with respect to which men of good character and principles may differ. And in these, they think it the duty both of private Christians and societies to exercise mutual forbearance towards each other. On our theme of connectivity, we can say we can only remain connected if we do exercise mutual forbearance towards others, despite, despite those places where we may acceptably differ. And these American uh, revisions to the standards, we should also note, including Witherspoon's preliminary principles and the modifications in the American church, were also more opposed to power centralizing than the original version of the confession was. While the divines of Westminster had clearly opposed Erastianism, they yet retained a church-state connection through the power of the magistrate to call a church assembly. Witherspoon and others recognized that this was no longer possible. 
in the American context. Liberty in the nation and liberty in religion were the themes of the day. It was certainly Witherspoon's view that to be connected as Presbyterians is to share a common faith as exhibited in the confession, but also to remain together ever steadfast against both political and ecclesiastical tyranny. So we come then to the fourth and final part of this speech. And here, I want to look at the contemporary improvements. This is the term Witherspoon used for applications. Maybe if as a pastor, if you're sick of saying every week, here are some applications. Say, here are some improvements. <laughs> what might we learn from Witherspoon in regard to connectivity among Christians today? It's certainly difficult to bridge the gap of that many years and the, the cultural differences, such vastly different worlds. And we are complicated even more in connectivity when it comes the time with our coronavirus pandemic. When I was first given this speech subject, I think it was before the pandemic started. And then I had to rewrite the speech. Things change. Connectivity has taken on entirely new dimensions. So in a tantalizing statement in the, from the biographer Collins, he says of Witherspoon, he seems to have prepared for publication a vol volume of essays intended to promote church unity, but this project came to naught, and his manuscripts on the subject have been lost. So we don't know what he would have said on connectivity in those manuscripts. And it may even be that John Witherspoon did not, would not want to give us advice. The story goes that after the death of his first wife, and he, at, he was 69 years old, he remarried to a widow who was but 24 years of age. And visiting the house of a friend en route to his wedding, his friend, the host, said to him, Doctor, you do not seem to be well matched, <laughs> which his biographer calls a veiled allusion to the disparity of age between himself and his bride-elect. To this man, to his friend, his host, Witherspoon retorted before clamoring into his carriage, I neither give advice nor do I take any. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes actions speak louder than words. And when we look at Witherspoon's life, one thing is crystal clear related to connectivity. You must be involved to be connected. That'll be the first of three points here as we look at improvements from Witherspoon. Be involved, be steadfast, and embrace your place. And this is a speech with ministers largely in mind, so I speak to pastors as I speak of these things. Be involved, be steadfast, embrace your place. First, be involved. The obligation to serve where you are extends beyond your pastorate to your chaplaincy, your neighborhood, your presbytery, your synod, your family, so many other things. Involvement is crucial. We must be involved. To college graduates, Witherspoon gave the parting advice. Avoid, avoid sloth as a dangerous enemy. We see this in Witherspoon's life and his involvement in so many things, bringing those connections together and giving him that standing to organize the church. We can trust this guy. It's our involvement in multiple places that fosters connectivity and uncovers opportunities for evangelism. I want you to consider these names. What comes into your mind when you hear these names? Pine, Bacchus, Sutherland, Lyra, involvement in many places, fostering success through connectivity. These are men who are pastors, but they're also involved. Chaplains, mission leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Piano players, I learned that one this week. So impressed. Be involved. Also, be steadfast. Witherspoon's steadfastness 
can teach us about the value of involvement and how it fosters connectivity. His connections in one place led to success in another, in a virtuous cycle, from one good event to another, always leading upwards. And he neither sought escape nor retirement. He did not even put life on hold when the Redcoats came. Except for a brief period during the war, the College of New Jersey continued to train ministers. To our own situation, we must think if the Redcoats are not going to stop his preaching, then certainly we should not put our work on hold for fear of a virus or anything else. We must be ever steadfast. This may mean alternative ways. For a short period, I was doing some online sermons and printing sermons and handing them door to door without opening the door too much to the elderly in our community. Be steadfast. We must continue to ever be steadfast as Christians to train others from the scriptures, preaching the word of God and leading by example to be a benefit to our families, our churches, and our communities. So we see from Witherspoon, be involved, be steadfast, and third, embrace your place. A great part of this being involved and fostering connectivity means that you, especially as a minister, must embrace your place. There's something of permanence in the ancient world when we see uh, Paul telling Titus to appoint elders in every town. People didn't move much back then. They were, had to embrace their place. This is where they were called to be. They didn't have U-Hauls or two men in a truck or any of these things. The Lord has called you to a certain place and called you to connect to the people where you are. Not every postman, of course, gets the Hawaii delivery route. And not every pastor gets called to Cape Canaveral. <laughs> The Lord has called you to where you are, with all of the challenges it presents. And it's to that place that your presence must be known. Connectivity in the church, especially a smaller church, starts with being connected with each and every person there. And then being visible in the community. As I read briefly from Titus, not only there in Titus do we see this idea of pointing elders in every town where they are to be. This is their place. They're not missionaries going around. They're to embrace their place. We also see Paul's advice to the elders to show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned. We are, as ministers, our, our primary task, that highest objective, is preaching. Sermons is that, is, that, is that time where people listen to us. It's that special time that we as ministers have. And teaching is incredibly important. I would never downplay teaching and preaching. But we see also here, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. We as ministers are not to limit ourselves to preaching and teaching. We're to be involved, chaplains, as uh, civic. I, I've done a lot of funerals in the community and praying at events in the village, um, in missions, and with other people, with counseling ministries. One of the fantastic things about the BP, involvement through counseling and the connectivity that that brings. So we learn from Witherspoon, be steadfast, be involved, embrace your place, fight the good fight of the faith. And I pray you will see the fruit both of connectivity and from connectivity issue forth 